You are listening to Making It in the Toy Industry, episode number 183. Welcome to Making It in the Toy Industry, a podcast for inventors and entrepreneurs like you. And now your host, Ajel Wade. Welcome back to another episode of the Toy Coach Podcast, Making It in the Toy Industry. I am thrilled to do this episode with my guest, Brandon Braswell, who's also a TCA alumni, but Brandon went above and beyond and really did more than just develop a product. He created an entire TV show, and he did a really incredible pitch that he pitched at the Toy Creators Academy virtual pitch event. And because so many TCAers and so many people that listen to my podcast are asking about IP pitches, and it is not my specialty... I thought, let's bring Brandon on to share his incredible pitch that really had everybody, you know, excited about his line. So, Brandon, welcome to the show, first and foremost. Hello, hello, and thank you for having me. I love it. I'm excited to be part of this movement that you've created. Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. (laughs) So, first question I've got to ask is, what is the name of your brand? Tell us a little bit about it. Sure. So, my brand is called 9 to 5 Warriors. And it's a 90s inspired toy line that aims to recapture the magic of the Saturday morning cartoon era. At least that's what I put out there into the world. And like what that means to me, the magic of the Saturday morning cartoon era is creating toys that re-spark imagination and make you want to build with your hands or like just get fully immersed and create your own adventures. What was your favorite Saturday morning cartoon? Oh man, I have so many, but... Ninja Turtles in general was like the biggest franchise for me. Like, I just know it took over everything. Like, all my birthday parties, all my sleepovers. The the second one? Oh, Ninja Turtles in general, you said. Ninja Turtles in general, yeah, yeah. Uh, Like, I grew up with the classics, like, term, I mean, term, (laughs) Transformers, G.I. Joe. Uh, Those are, of course, memorable but i would say like ninja turtles had the biggest impact in my my childhood yeah i i remember i had a ninja i had a Raphael. i think came to my birthday party once when i was a kid <laughs> but my saturday morning cartoon was actually recess i probably was a little bit old for them back then but i remember i was obsessed with recess like every saturday morning i was like oh yeah recess is on so <laughs> i don't know so that was a weird. great show too man yeah. i think we're we were spoiled our generation and that's what I'll get into like my pitch circles around that era. Mm-hmm. And as I was saying, it's just like story rich content, fun yep. character. Honestly, how many amazing toy lines that are still today being released and still today making an impact in like the new generation and mostly our, our people our age who are now accounting for like one out of every four toys. <laughs> right. <laughs> so-, so true. <laughs> Okay, what is the essence? This goes into the next area. What is the essence and mission behind 9 to 5 Warriors? So, like I mentioned, that whole recapturing the Saturday morning cartoon era, like to me, creativity is everything, like re-sparking imagination in the toys. And that was deeply rooted when I sat in that thought, like, okay, why do I want to create a toy? Why do those toys, you know, from my yesteryears still resonate with me today? What is it about that? I boiled it down to story. And to me, story was everything. It's what creates, you know, the difference between a toy and the toys that made us. And I wanted to start there with when I created a toy because I had, as I, I showed, told you before joining the TCA, I had no idea how to make a toy. <laughs> but I, I, I quickly Googled what I could do. Yeah. It looked incredibly overwhelming and complicated. <laughs> so I started with what I knew and that's story, storytelling. So my essence is really like, yeah, just re-sparking imagination, getting people excited about it. And that start, started with me with story. And what inspired you with this idea? What was that first thing that made you think, oh, you know, it would be really cool? Making a toy? <laughs> really? So I, I, yeah, no, no. Uh, I was finishing your sentence. Oh, uh, but. Oh. I was in LA, uh, there was this diner and it was a cool little setup that you wait for your food and there's a toy store next door. And at the time I was like in my twenties, I hadn't never collected toys, wasn't into, into toys at that point. I was like, I had my toys as a, as a kid and now I'm a grown up. I didn't think twice about it, but walking into that store, a vintage toy shop, I was like smacked with nostalgia and like waves of memories came to me. And I was just like, hit with so much joy and like rush of memories that I totally forgot. And I was like, what is that? Like that sensation. And as I allude to, like my background is storytelling. I'm a Mm -hmm. video. 
and professionally uh, my job is to invoke some sort of emotion through video and I was getting that emotion evoked by a physical product and I never had that before so that to me was just like how do I recreate that how do I capture that magic that I just experienced and I wanted to create a toy from from that exact moment and I was just like I want to do that for someone else I want to do that for the generation growing up so like that's awesome it's so funny because you you were inspired to create this toy and then you look into the toy industry and you're like that's too complicated what I'm gonna do is something <laughs> more complicated and build and build an entire IP and world so if you're listening to this episode and you're actually watching it live with us on YouTube, hello. I saw you there, Carla, and I saw somebody else with a name with a name that starts with an M. She's new to our community. Um, if you have questions as we go through the pitch that we're going to play soon, please throw them into the chat. I can see what you guys are commenting, and I will ask Brandon your questions live. So the next step after you d- you had this idea and you thought, okay, I'm going to make the toy. And then that's too complicated. I'm going to make the IP. And then eventually you found me and you joined TCA and you came to the TCA virtual pitch event. Now, this pitch video, I hope this is the right video because of what I'm going to describe right now. Yeah, this- but this, okay, this pitch video is actually the result of you having just being on vacation and you were like, Ajel, I'm going to be on vacation <laughs> and I can't, I'm afraid the Wi Fi won't be strong enough for me to pitch and show my idea. So you cut together. Um, footage you already had of your brand and created like a pre-recorded pitch. And when I saw it, I was like, oh my gosh, this is better than (laughs) if you just pitched it live. (laughs) And you even got that feedback from people at Hasbro like, oh, wow, this was the best pitch I've ever seen, right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, since I have the the superpowers of video editing, I did want to even it out. Like I actually did do the whole thing one take and recorded it because I rehearsed my pitch over and over and over. Yeah. And my fear was exactly that. like I would run out of Wi-Fi and I couldn't trim, you know, like it was slow. So I did everything in one take as if I was pitching and showing the zoom as I had planned or my presentation as I had planned. Yeah. And when I just put it together, like, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I think it captured my, hopefully my passion and the idea at the end, like at the end of the day. And it did resonate with them. I, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, I hear something rustling in the background. Be careful of your mic. I hear something going over it. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But okay, I want to play the video uh, before I do, because I want to talk about the, what happened after you pitched this video. What were you thinking um, before the pitch event? Like, were you excited to be a part of it? What was going through your mind? Yeah, honestly, this was my first opportunity to pitch it professionally and you know, with everything, you know, because at that point I already had all 10 prototypes. I created the commercials, which you'll see. I created, you know, the animation, which was, which I'll get into too. Like, so you kind of alluded to it, like how did I jump into it? And I took the longer route. Well, unfortunately, like TCA wasn't around back then. This was like yeah. 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did whatever I could and navigated, you know, oh, shiny light here. Maybe I should do that. Maybe I should do this. Like I was very. Un- Ooh, as so I'm- I was. Uh huh. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. I well, I'm no, just. No, so I was just excited to put it all together and show it. Okay, awesome. Let Let's try to play this. Let's hope the audio works. If not, I might have to take my headphones off. So, introducing the Nine to Five Warriors. Now, if you're just joining us, I just want to say what we're about to look at. Brandon Braswell had invented this toy show and toy line um, called Nine to Five Warriors, and this was his pitch deck that he used at the TCA virtual pitch event when he was pitching to Hasbro. So let's hit play so we can learn from Brandon. Is it going to... It's loading. Hey, thank you so much for the opportunity. Could you hear that? Yeah. Oh, you can? Oh, you could hear it? Oh, perfect. Okay, starting again. Hey, thank you so much for the opportunity to pitch. First and foremost, I'm excited to share this passion project with you. My name is Brandon Braswell, and I'm the creator of 9to5 Warriors. 9to5 Warriors is a 90s-inspired toy line that aims to recapture the magic of the Saturday morning cartoon era. To me as a kid, there's nothing better than diving into a bowl of cereal and watching my favorite cartoons. To see what the characters got themselves into or how they eventually saved the day was a great experience. But to me, the real magic happened when the shows ended and I took the adventures off screen and into my own hands with the toys. To me, story is everything. It's what brings the characters to life. It's what sparks imagination. It's what creates that unbreakable bond that lasts generations. To me, it's what sets the difference between a toy and the toys that made us. So when I went out to create my own toy, I started there. This is how 9 to 5 Warrior Story begins. Nine to five warriors, just as the light gets 
lowered. That's when they all take over. At night, the fighting begins. There's no telling which side will win. Some good, some bad, some crazy, some rad. Commandos and bandits, they both just gotta have it. Nine to five warriors. Gentle electricity, brought them all to life, you see. This is how they came to be, brought to this reality. It happens every day from nine to five. So meet Alan McMillan. He's your typical Toys R Us kid that never quite did grow up. He's stuck in that uncreative office in a cubicle working that 9 to 5 grind. You might know the feeling. But, you know, it's based in the 90s, so there is no Instagram to keep him distracted. In the interim, he actually spends most of his time creating his own action figures made out of office supplies and leftover food. He wages this imaginary battle between the water cooler commandos and the break room bandits. It was all fun and games until one freak accident involving his Japanese energy jink, Jensei, sparked him all to life. Now Alan is caught in the middle of a real world battle for total office domination. It'd be a miracle if he gets any work done, basically. <laughs> so now that you know a little bit about the backstory, I'd love to introduce you to the toys. Finally, a reason to go back to the office. Introducing 9 to 5 Warriors, an exciting new toy line created for the Toys R Us kid that never grew up. Offering 10 unique characters that are perfect for your cubicle or home office. The 9 to 5 Warriors are available through Big Bad Toy Store. Join the battle alongside Major Eraser and the Water Cooler Commandos as they keep the peace. Or wreak havoc with Colonel Custard and the Break Room Bandits. Choose your side as these two forces clash over total office domination. It happens every day from nine to five. Warning, do not leave unattended. Each figure sold separately. When you punch out, they come punching in. These are the good guys, the Water Cooler Commandos, led by the fearless Major Eraser. Major and the Water Cooler Commandos know that their existence was a mistake and that they're there to maintain office peace and keep their existence a secret. They know that if the world ever knew of them or the power of Jensei ever got into wrong hands, humanity could crumble. So he and a ragtag group of office supplies maintain the office peace and keep their existence a secret. It'd be an easy day's work if it wasn't for the evil mastermind Colonel Custard. He and the break room bandits scour the office searching for Jensei and creating new minions along the way. They're hell-bent on total office domination and seeking revenge against the wasteful humans that once tossed them away. So going back to the 90s nostalgia, all 10 of these characters were sculpted by Scott Hensley, the man behind 90% of the toys I grew up with. He hand-sculpted them and brought that unique special feel that is not only new, but has that familiar feel to them, which was important to me to go into the target demographic, that nostalgia-chasing millennial that now accounts for one out of every four toys being sold, a $9 billion marketplace. So this was all done strategically to combat the difficulties of launching a new brand. I grounded it in familiar setting and filled it with nostalgia that they're searching for. This project started 10 years ago where I focused on the story with comic books and trading cards and a bunch of other fun products. This is all self-finance and I currently have the initial 10 prototypes and I'm working with Big Bad Toy Store to take pre-orders. I believe this is just the start of what's possible with this concept from the comics to video games to TV series and movies. I'm now at a critical point where I can continue down the path as an indie toy maker or with the help of a partner like Hasbro, I can ensure that 9 to 5 Warriors is the catalyst to the next generation of Saturday morning cartoons for the kids growing up today. And I'd love the opportunity now to answer any questions you might have or discuss further. Thank you. I mean, I mean, <laughs> so great. I'm sure I'm about to minimize this and come up to so many questions. Um, for people that are watching live. Uh, but so, yeah, I have, I have so many. Okay, so J Yasmin's here. <laughs> I've got someone Bible trivia game, Carla Morrow. So guys, if you have questions, uh, please ask them. Brandon's here to answer them. But okay, amazing pitch. It was so, it was interactive. You called out the company. I mean, I always teach you guys, like put the company name like in the presentation, but like you were like, I did one better and I'm just going to call out their name. Uh, what was the feedback as soon as you had that pit, you finished that part of the pitch? So what was great too, like I said, this was like the first time presenting it period, like professionally like that and everything all at once. Right. What was great is like their reaction to things that I hope that they would catch up on. You know, they mentioned things that are not in the presentation. Like, Oh, this reminds me of that specific toy line. Ninja Turtles, one of okay. this is Hasbro. And it was, I thought that was really cool. He's like, I get this sensation of that, this, this, and that. And he also said like, I could see the potential of the story going this way and that way, you know, like all I wanted to do is kind of provide like 
kind of guide rails of like this is where I'm headed or at least the potential of what it could be. Mm-hmm. But it, for me, it was just, I don't want to overload you with everything, but yeah, the possibilities could be endless. And I like the feedback that like I saw a light in his eye that like saw that, oh, this could be that, this could be this, like, you know, I, that was my, I, my, my feedback. I did see that. I, oh, so we do have a question coming in, guys. Keep them coming in. The first question I want to prompt you with, though, is you've been developing this over 10 years, right? Yeah, but with that caveat of like stopping and going yeah. from basically like, like it, I think as you can see, I'm like, I have a lot, an overachiever, I like to say, like, yeah. perfectionist to my own demise because are then, you a Virgo? No, no. <laughs> Born Capricorn rising. <laughs> wow, you know the detail. So, okay. Yeah, yeah. When did you start doing the toy part of it? Because the next question that we have from Paulette, I'm going to bring that up on the screen, is how mm-hmm. did he get the prototype made with, considering the costs involved? Um, so, yeah, let's talk about like when and how you got that developed. When did you start the toy part? Sure. So the toy part started in 2020. Like most of us, you know, work kind of abruptly stopped because of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And I was in a travel business and obviously travel died. And I was like, let me utilize this opportunity that's been like scratching at the back of my head. Like I said, I started this 10 years ago. And at yeah. this point, it's been eight years since I picked it up again. And I'd always keep thinking like I should start it again. I should do something. I should Let me look at the prices again. Maybe they're not expensive. Wrong. Yeah. It was actually more. <laughs> but I was like, let's try it like whatever let me at least do one so Something. i chose i I, oh. I discovered scott hensley who i i talked about in a pitch and he's uh-huh. the sculptor behind ninja turtles uh he did like all the bad guys he's did you know star trek um exo squad like practically street sharks like so many toys that i literally grew up with and when I discovered him like he's perfect like it's already nostalgia it's already 90s based i want it it to be hand sculpted and to quickly also answer i did attempt in the past and i made a lot of expensive mistakes hiring the wrong freelancers going a different route not receiving my product after paying for it like there's a lot of trials and tribulations that like you do coach like wait say that last part again you broke up after trials and tribulations oh that you you clearly state this in the tca like the do nots, the top 10 do nots. I was basically like, Chuck did it. Chuck oh my did God. it. Chuck did it. <laughs> Wait, you, really? Man. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Because it, obviously you get excited. You want to create something. And again, yeah. without guidelines, you, know, you just you just follow the wrong pieces. So, yeah. sorry, I'm long winded. But no, 2020 no, comes. Great. I, find Scott, I find Scott and we settle on a prize. It was expensive. And I decided to do one figure. That process takes a couple of weeks, months maybe. And I received that fix. Like, ah, oh, I gotta do another one. That was such an amazing experience. <laughs> to have it in your hands, to have it come to life, you know? Yeah. So yeah, to, to answer is like what made me decide is since I already had the animations, I already did the wax packs, I already did the comic book, I did all these things besides actually attempt to make the toys. It was to me just let me try to go fully out and actually make a toy and follow the procedures. So I, I Googled talk- and researched around. I want to talk a little bit about the cost of those prototypes, though, because people listening might be like, oh, but seriously, like, how did you fund it? And I want to do this from the perspective of someone who also started their own business, this the toy coach, but also prior to this costumize me. And when I started my product based business, which was costumize me, I worked full time and I very intentionally set aside a budget of money every month so that I could invest that into my business. And then when I did the toy coach, it was a budget of money that I set aside. And once I had a certain amount, I was like, okay, I can do this. Is that how you managed to to afford your prototypes? Or did you do grants? Did you do any Kickstarters or anything like that? Um, since I went, I have multiple answers to that, of course, because the first one was strictly like, it was 2020. I don't know if you remember around that time, like cryptocurrency and all this other crap was happening. Yeah. And I took crypto and it gave me a little bit of extra money so that was like a lucky strike i wanted to but everything else i funded previously to that the the wax paper products would still cost a lot of money to do that was all you know putting away money and just like okay if i'm gonna make the initial step 
uh, let me just try it. Okay, it's eight hundred dollars here. Okay, twelve hundred dollars there. Like it adds up very quickly, and it was very overwhelming. And again, without the guidelines, I kind of kept on spending money and wasting money. Hmm. But truthfully, even when I made all ten, eventually I got smarter. I got better. I found better prices. I understood more ways to save money in the long run. But ultimately, I did spend a very pretty penny on creating all these prototypes. There's kind of no way of all, but I did 10, not one. <laughs> Give us some tips around that. What, if you can remember three tips of how you learned to save money from yeah. prototype one to prototype 10. Yeah, I want to preface too that we live right now in a day and age where like anything is possible. And there's so many cool tools that you can do, whether it's building your own website or coding or like anything like that. Like you could take the power in your own hands as well as find cheap, affordable freelancers outside of the United States. So one of the first things I used was like freelancer.com. This was before Fiverr. Oh. Fiverr.com is as well, you know, like, yeah. but this is a caveat too. Like, as you warned in your, your courses, like sometimes you find the wrong freelancer and it kind of wastes more money. You have to do your due diligence and like look at prior examples, make sure that they really actually know what they're doing. See if they deliver, they're over promising and, you know, the virtue is always like, if it's too good to be true, it's usually because it's not going to happen. It's not true. I, <laughs> I had a team that, you know, promised me to make all 10 for $800. What? This was like, which is insane. Like, let's just be realistic. Mm -hmm. And they handed t 10 products at the end, like 10 models. They were not 3D printable. They were not toys. They were not nothing. Wow. But that was a, a way of dollars. Of course, yeah. I was just anxious to make it. But um, so... To save money, I mean, honestly, try to scrap together, like, what are you naturally good at? Like, for me, video comes into my wheelhouse of power. Like, I know video and I know I can create something. I can create something that conveys. Maybe I can use it to barter, you know? People need video. Maybe, like, I, I honestly, I'm a hustler. So I try to work my way around every situation to avoid spending so much money. So I offered barter situations at the time. I offered, you know... Um, or just saving or doing extra freelance work on the side so I can pay for it. Like, yep. there's like, I'm not lying. Like, there's so many different opportunities. So, even if you see one path and it's very expensive, like, just keep searching. Keep, utilize Fiverr, utilize freelancers, look, utilize different community networks. There's always someone willing to do it for cheap or free. Or, like, there's partnerships you can come mm -hmm. up with. Like, that's what I'll, I, I honestly can say. Just try everything. <laughs> as soon as Brandon gets his um, his inventory, we've been talking about a partnership swap on our end too, <laughs> like yeah, video yeah. See, for like, sales. Where <laughs> we've been talking, exactly. so you know there is always an opportunity. Um, I I really thank you so much for sharing that. And and the the other tip that I know I've, I've mentioned in TCA is well, one in TCA I do have a uh, kind of a breakdown of what these things normally cost so you can compare. Mm -hmm. And then, but then I also always say like, get three prices, like get prices from three yeah. people. So you can kind of gauge like, all right, if this person's done this before and this person's done this before and they're charging this much, maybe this person charging $800 for 10 figures is out of their mind. <laughs> you know, there are yeah, people yeah, that just exactly. say yes to get the quick money, you know? Um, and I want to touch on that again too, yeah. because I'll be, I'll be, uh, you know, transparent. One of my prototypes cost $5,000 alone wow. just for one character. Then the another 3D character, model? Um, or the I won't even go into this. Yeah, because some are hand sculpted and some are 3D modeled. There's there's a mixture in prices and the time frames and the technology it allows. But one's $5,000 alone. Uh -huh. The other one could be, uh, one is like, I think I only spend around $800. Uh -huh. And okay. the quality. And that was digital, but there's like so many things, but also because of the pandemic, $5,000 is the initial, let's say people also freelancers that they're artists themselves. They're willing to negotiate, especially if you're trying to do more than one and ah, also I see. for work too. Like there's, as, as I was, I did get three prices. I always try to just find the, the best solution, mm -hmm. but Again, if it's too good to be true, then just avoid, avoid yeah. that one. <laughs> that point yeah. about freelancers offering a deal when you do multiple is a great point. Even me as my own service provider, when you have to choose between when it's one client giving you multiple projects, you're more likely to say, yeah, I'll give you a break because if I don't, I have to learn and onboard a whole new client. 
So it's like, sometimes it's like, it's actually easier if we develop another thing together because I understand you and I know what you're looking for. I know the vibe of the character. Whereas if I get a new client, it's kind of starting over. And sometimes, don't you think in the toy industry, it's also if they really just want to work on your project, they're like, all right, I'll give you a break. Like, I'll give you a break because it's really cool. <laughs> that that energy of wanting to work on a project, yeah. from a buyer's perspective, like let's say I have three quotes. Yeah. If I have really expensive, one that's just kind of cheap and the one in the middle that's kind of higher but still relatively affordable. If the one in the middle is excited about it, I'm going to pay that extra dollar. Or even yep. if it's the higher, I'm going to pay that extra dollar because they are genuinely taking the excitement. They're, they're oh, I could do this. Yes. I could see, like I see firing off. And then, to me, that's a guarantee to be a better output, you know, like versus taking someone like, yeah, this is what I charge. Here's, here's, the, uh, here's this, here's my invoice, like – because you can see it sometimes in the work. If, if it's a, something as hands-on as a hand sculpt, you can kind of, sometimes kind of see it, the, the passion yeah. that went behind it. Absolutely. And that was, what was cool is that that's exactly what did happen. I, I chose two different sculptors kind of going simultaneously. Uh-huh. Um, with Scott, I saw his excitement. He's been doing this for years, you know, and I yeah. saw in the background Pringles out and like different chips and he would create like weapons out of the paper clips and other things and like mm-hmm. we I saw his brain going off with the imagination just working on like yeah. how could this be a cool story? and the same way in the digital and like I saw him light up with certain characters and it was like that's the energy you kind of want to stay in when you're creating something fun oh my gosh I just realized that that's the top of a coffee cup that's so brilliant <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's so funny um okay let me go quickly into a few other things. Um, oh, I have so many things. Are, I don't know if we can talk about this. Where can you buy your this line, 9 to 5 Warriors, right now? Is it currently available for s- retail sale anywhere? Yeah. So I initially launched a pre-sale for all 10 at one. And it's a kind of thing you don't want to do. Mm-hmm. Like you want to start with one and like kind of open up. But I was ambitious and I was like, not many people have video. Maybe and I can. You hadn't taken know. TCA yet. And then. <laughs> yeah. So we know the story. But yeah. so only four are going to move through production right only now. Only say that again. State. You broke up. Only four will be moving through toward production. Okay. So those four pre ordered through Big Bad Toy Store. And that was another gamble I took was like, you can go the Kickstarter route. And again, being kind of doing this for a little bit like i know the benefits of going to kickstarter out is like a you get the majority of the money but the caveat is you're going to get a shipment from china eventually a really large shipment from china a pallet uh you're going to need to put that pallet somewhere so that's warehouse space you're going to break you're going to have to have packaging you're going to have to break those down that's that's man hours it's stuff that like i just knew i didn't want to take away from a my my main job or things i just didn't want to do like i'm not going to yeah. sit there you know, pack I'll probably make a mistake. I'm dyslexic. I'll send it to the yeah. wrong place. Yeah. So I took a partner with a retail, um, like Big Bad Toy Store. I figured I can leverage their email um, campaign, and their audience reach. They're well known within the toy industry. They obviously have a factory. They, ob- I mean, warehouse. They obviously know how to handle packages. They know how to like ship it out, and they can handle everything. What that meant is a smaller amount of money that actually goes towards me. Like they're buying it at home directly, a wholesale price. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that was, I don't want to say another mistake, but I probably will go the Kickstarter route for the remaining six. Cause I still want to make the, the, the remaining six. Yes. And, and like the consensus, like everyone keeps DMing me, Hey, when's, when are they going to be available? When's the Kickstarter? When's this? Like, so I know that the demand is there, but I want to still just get these four out to show that I can actually deliver on my word, you know? And plus, I want to make the damn toys already. <laughs> these are the years. four, right? Right here? These four? Are these yeah. the ones? That- uh, so two good guys and two bad guys. The, the leaders of each and, you know, like the sidekicks. Awesome. Love that. Okay, so when do you have a plan for your Kickstarter? When's it going out? Um, right now, my focus is just getting to production. So I just got the oh, Paint okay. Masters yesterday. Enough. Um, I'm going to send those off to China. Um, then start tooling. Tooling's probably going to take, you know, 45 yeah, days of yeah. X amount of time. Then it starts the production process. So I'm praying, you know, before just November or even October, like, and I can actually have these done, but we'll see. So, it's, it's Everything's reliable in China. 
I do want to hail you for the focus because I, I mean, obviously, even myself, and I've definitely seen some TCAers want to do everything at once, like want to have a book and want to develop a show and pitch it and want to have the product and 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 sell it in retail and to sell it to consumers and want to do all the things at one time. Um, but I really admire the fact that you're able to focus and say, okay, I have these retail sales. I'm going to focus on getting that done and then we'll make a plan for Kickstarter and not overdo over stretching yourself to make sure you can deliver high quality. Yeah. And I, it's always kind of been like that. Yes, I've jumped around, but time and like, it's just, that's my personality too. But even when I first started, I focused just on the animation. Like mm-hmm. I wanted something to convey how they were made. You know, I created a, a 60 second anime show that doesn't exist yet. <laughs> the, oh, the show open basically. So a catchy theme song, show how they were made, some action shots. And I focused on that. I said, let me get that through the line because to me that's important when I'm going to actually go to um, producing it, which was the next thing was to produce the wax packs to trading cards, another element to expand upon the story. Um, I want to – Then the comic book to expand upon the story yet again. And adding to Paulette's question, which I pulled up here, asking, are you going to manufacture yeah. or are you going to license? Clearly, you're manufacturing manufacturing the toys, but would you like to license the show, I'm guessing? I'm very open to everything. Like Honestly, it's one of those things that like the bright opportunity that will present itself. Um, thanks to your course, I actually learned a lot more. Like I knew I was asking for things in the universe. Like I want to be able to do this. And you start seeing like, oh, that's actually a very small percentage. Like you... You, people don't really realize like, okay, you're selling to, as you put it, like here's your four to five percent of a sale mm-hmm. to a wholesale. Mm-hmm. After this amount, and the retailer is making this percent, like it's yeah. kind of, you're like trickling down. But it's never been about money. It's like just getting the idea out. Yeah. Because like my mission is out there. Like the story is out there. Hopefully it's invoking and hopefully it is the catalyst to the next generation of Saturday morning cartoons. As a, I started this saying, it's like our generation had that luxury of so many different shows. And I truly believe that the toy industry is in the state that it currently is because no one's taking the risk and investment and in creating new IPs. Like we mm-hmm. keep doubling because again, the, when you really think about like the in, in my pitch, I say one out of four every adults are the are contributing to the sales of toys. One nine out, billion four, dollars. Nine billion. Yeah. When you asking why, like that's because the marketing and stories and everything was established over twenty years ago, <laughs> and good story matters because uh. the show ran and it was not Netflix back then, so it didn't just suck you in and series after series after series. You yeah. had time to. Turn TV and play with your toy. From that point on, you took what you saw on TV, characters, storylines, but you created your whole new ones. And that's what resonated. And that's what keeps them buying it today. That's what kept me, that's what created that spark when I picked up the toy in the toy shop. So if toy companies really pay attention to that and stop trying to go on like a fad or a, 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 a something like a widget, some sort of magical thing or an app pairing device and things that you know are just passive like focus on story because yeah. everything's about story pitch I, itself was well, a hold story on. now i've got a whole <laughs> i'm pulling down ken's fo- a question because now what you're asking leads it into yasmin's question she wants to ask how did it go with hasbro so i got a follow-up and they said it, since his department was i believe it was like what toys and he yeah. wanted to pass me on payment yeah i got the email to be passed to entertainment and then it like fizzled away and then I got an email from the entertainment department saying that someone's in changing head head positions, you know, uh, clearly a change in infrastructure or whatnot. Like the guy that I pitched to yes, did like ask entertainment, but yeah, Mark, yeah. but unfortunately then that person got changed out and I should maybe follow up. Like, oh, one of those yeah, things. I was literally about to know, yell at you. It's oh my no, fault. Fault. absolutely <laughs> not. Watch, watch somebody <laughs> from Hasbro watches this video. And they're like, wow, he just, he just, he just dropped us. He didn't even, (laughs) I I would recommend following up with Mark and saying, Hey, I know there were a few changes in entertainment. I still really believe in this line. I know you were really excited about it. Is there someone new you could put me in touch with so that I can pitch this to them? 
correct. See, <laughs> let me chat GPT that real quick. I know. I mean, that you guys gel GPT it. I just told you what to say. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so but this goes back to the the caveat of this entrepreneur mindset, as you said, like you yeah, kind of good, and then you have this, you know, imposter syndrome. I, that's why he's taking. You don't here. have to tell I'm, me. Then you come out. So that's something I definitely like. The biggest struggle is that, like cast aside any manufacturing issues or team issues, freelancing, money wasting. Like the biggest thing is imposter syndrome. Uh And that is words every day. Like, oh, it is actually really good. Watching the pitch. Yeah, watching the pitch. Like (laughs) this should be on TV right now. Everybody in the comments is like, what? All right, we have a few more questions. I'm going to put one up from Ken. Ken wants to know, do you have a following for your toys or for your brand? Sorry. Uh, I slowly build it on Instagram. Um, as Zell and I were just talking about Instagram, I have a catch 22 with social media, like, and mm-hmm. coming from them really quickly, like if you're investing so much into social media, like there's something that you just don't own, you don't they own it algorithm very quickly. And then your content dries up. What I found is that as soon as I start investing, you know, $500, who suppose, of course it engages. And I got massive amounts of followers. I got great comments. As soon as I stopped paying, the engagement fell through. Yep. Like just found a, like, I'm not going to keep spending money, which is very expensive. I spent like $2,000 on marketing alone, which then I'm like, that's not that much compared or how much a company that, but I'm like, that's $2,000 I could put towards a product or put towards another prototype or a comic or something on an artist, something else. So the following is there. It's scattered, you know, TikTok, Facebook groups, all that stuff. Thankfully, I did my due diligence of launching a while ago and embedding myself in the com- the toy community, which at the time was a lot of art toys and mm-hmm. definitely toys that were just literally created by artists. They didn't, they were the vinyl community, et cetera. So my following is within there and I do well anytime I do post on Reddit, let's say like the, I see the post and the engagement and it keeps me going. But yeah, I don't know what a significant amount of following is. I remember you even you might have said that in the TCA or something in, a, in the Maybe. past. It was like yeah. people with hundreds of thousands of followers still not monetizing. It's still, no, it's still not enough for an IP. You know, like it's still oh sometimes, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I did have. Mm-hmm. I've I've shopped IPs for licensing that had like hundreds of thousands of followers, and still they're like, nah. It's it's timing also <laughs> though, because if it's like yeah. too old, if it's not really trending right now, licensing is so trend driven, like. So yeah, and I would say um, if you're not gathering emails from those co- those those followers of yours, you should. I would invest money yeah. in retargeting ads that lead them to a landing page to sign up for the next drop of characters that are going to be available to sale for sale, so that you can own those contacts, get email, get phone number, so you can text and email. Um, I would definitely use the money to collect what you already should own. And you're totally right. Like 100%. it's not, it's not safe to build a business on Instagram. The past couple of months, I really didn't use Instagram as much. Um, and I'm really trying to move away from like relying on that platform for visibility and instead like building the email list, building the podcast, but like you got to take people yeah. away from the platforms you don't own essentially 100 percent, and i that is something that like <clears throat> i do and i just need to focus harder on doing so yeah it's it, it's easy and it's it, it, it's time it's not only time consuming it just costs money as it you're saying does cost money, yeah. and all this stuff it's like right now i'm still trying to pay for the production like yeah i raise a good amount but i still have to pay out of pocket and yeah. uh, the beautiful thing is is that like Right now, like again, with the focus, I want to focus on getting them through the finish line because I think once they're in people's hands, then I get, you know, the uh, natural marketing being done. You know, like people are going to do unboxings or reviews or just like, you know, yeah. I hopefully fan bases I already established those like diehards that I get DMs like, hey, what's going on? Like, this yeah, is yeah. a new character. Those people hopefully will be my cha- the champions and champion mm-hmm. the brand. I'm just trying to get to that point. You've got, well, you've got a lot of fans here. This is what people are saying about your video. Awesome. You know, we're seeing, um, that was five star, uh, you know, (laughs) uh, but we do have another question. Oh, and wow. You put a lot of work into your brand. You know, people are loving the video. Thank you. Um, and if you guys are watching live and you have more questions, I think we have a little bit more time. So toss them in now. The last big question I have here is from Scott. 
He asked, was there, were there any significant design changes or alterations as you went from preliminary design to sculpt to prototype? And were you open to things changing? Yeah. Every, every single time I work with a new artist and a different medium, so meeting like 2D to animation mm. from a 2D, 3D, 3D image to a 3D model, like every single time shifting from an artist or, or a medium it's always a design iteration. Like there's always something that comes up. Like for mm. instance, major uh, like arm wasn't long enough to bypass his thigh because the bow, like it's little things like that. Or even just, Oh, Scotchy's beard was just a little too long. So it interrupted with the, the tape thing, or uh, this is a different expression that we could try because it actually conveys, you know, oh, the, interesting. The, like how do you make a toy out of a can <laughs> and his facial expression is his whole thing and the the nuts inside are the you know the wow factor i guess and it was one of those characters that was the biggest challenge of making how do you make a toy out of a can but that because we did the work and the diligence and the thinking behind it expression stuff, he became a popular character when i i personally was like he's the last character i'm gonna do like i i wasn't even like I don't want to say interested in making a toy. I just didn't know how to make a toy. So that, that was a really cool experience to see, you know, artist interpretations, me learning. And then my interpretations, once I had a physical thing and me being the creator, like, okay, I think this expression can work because this leads to his personality, et cetera. And who did like these, like you have a whole commercial. Do you have episodes done? <laughs> no, not episodes. Those just are a commercial. technically. Like I have a Bible just in case people ask for a pitch. There's things I have, you know, like you have just comics. In case. Like, yeah. Are these full? How many comic stories do you have done? I have one that's published and a couple that are written, but I want to get the first one out and see how that does before. You better follow up with Hasbro. Second. I'm trying. I'm trying. Okay. <laughs> Hey, Mark. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm I'm sorry. I'm speechless <laughs> at how I. I mean, I knew it. I mean, I've seen it before, obviously, but seeing it again is just this big refresh reminder that of how incredible you are and how much you've done with this brand. Okay. Um, so In hindsight, me... what I want to add uh -huh. is like now learning from that, and again going through the course. And listening to different podcasts is it, it, at the end of the day, it's like <clears throat> a toy company is going to be worried about one thing, how to move that product off a shelf. Mm -hmm. And I really want to drill that down in the pitch. Like in hindsight, now looking, I kind of want to drill that in more and mm. focus on again, about like story. Like people need to take, invest the chance in creating story right now because that's what's going to like build that so. connection. And that pushes out those toys today still to those adults that are brainwashed from nine, oh, 20 years ago. You know, as I talked about um, how licensing is such a time-based thing, since you pitched, more and more toy companies have leaned into wanting to be entertainment companies. Now, they haven't outright said it. It's kind of an analysis that everyone in the industry is making based on the, the, the positions that seem to be getting laid off and then the positions that seem to be getting added to most toy companies, as well as yeah. things like the Barbie movie. I think there's a Rubik's Cube movie coming out. Um, I know Hasbro has a movie. I can't remember. They, but the, the Hot Wheels TV show. More and more toy companies are looking at a way to turn their brands into IPs. So I think that is a great opportunity for someone who has developed a full brand with a solid story that makes sense and is interesting and designed the toys with it. I mean, it, you know, for a company looking for something new, this seems like a no brainer. Which is, it's funny. Like, like I said, my business has been in video for years hmm. and business partner, I've been saying this for years, every company moving forward is going to turn into a media company. Yeah. And you look at Red Bull, like Red Bull was kind of a pioneer of this. Like they sell I mean, energy drinks, but at the end of the day, they have like a Red Bull channel, dirt bikes, skydiving, all these things are jumping off planes. And like, there's so much content behind that because it fuels the brand. It's more commercials. Basically it's real estate. Like it's content that's just being generated. Then people are tagging themselves in Red Bull. It becomes a, a movement. So, to go back, like Hasbro, I did listen to podcasts as well as Mattel. They were both transitioning into moving their company into more of a, a content driven. They wanted specifically, they said, like, I want to do what Disney Plus 
or Disney's done with the Star Wars franchise, or Disney's done with the Marvel franchise. Where did you hear that? What show? um, It was a podcast with Hasbro about most one of those like entrepreneur podcasts about like. But he specifically said he's going to move towards content, and that's why Transformers came out, and that's what like it's been out, but like they're tying in GI Joe and all these like that's the thing too because. You can make billions on toys, but you can also make billions just on IP, making the movies, the TV shows. Like, in a perfect world, I need to do a Medium article. Remind me, too. Mm-hmm. The streaming and the toys companies need to come together. Like, it has to Netflix company. Yes. Oh, and my gosh. That's yes. what I would love to pitch is that, like, listen, guys, you have this freaking amazing service called netflix that pushes out content everything they push out that's supposedly number one <laughs> on the week instantly yeah. is clearly going to get i tie that with the toy and you got a, a million multi-billion dollar success you know how do you afford to make all these videos though like the, like the like where well, that's me that's just me doing it uh, have, oh wait did like you I record film all it these? And I edit. you film all these yeah yeah, yeah. and the lighting the and lighting's a, so good thankfully my buddy does the lighting, so I a lot. <laughs> Thankfully, lighting. it's again, this, I think you have a podcast literally or a module too, like step into your own power. Like what can you do really yeah. well? Mm-hmm. Double it into toys. So this is, what, this is what I can honestly do. And obviously, toys need content. <laughs> That's what I was leading to. Yeah. And I think that I also have a podcast episode somewhere about it too, like the puzzle of you find what you're great at, combine the things you love with that to build what company or brand you should create. Oh, wow. I mean, congratulations. I mean, I know you haven't achieved what you want to achieve yet, but to everybody no, now here, I'm feeling successful. I'm like, hey, okay. you know what? Like, <laughs> like I I'm am awesome. pretty I'm good. It. I'm doing it. <laughs> I am doing it. Wow. Thank you. So. Yeah, you're uh, doing it's it. It's really for, you forget because you're like waiting for the m- milestone of it. For me, I have that vision of someone like a little kid picking it up in a toy aisle, you know, like mm. until I'm there, it's not done. But I'm like, no, it's actually making amazing progress. Like, yeah, the journey. Me, Honestly, I, I think that, that I'm, I don't I, I can't see the future, but I do believe if you had this product ready to be at a specialty show there are a lot of people would be drawn to it and you might get a few orders, which I feel then you'll be on the shelf and you'll have that feeling of like, Oh my gosh, I did it. You know, it's done. <laughs> um, and I just, as we close, Erin had one comment for you. I want you to see it. She said, she feels you as someone trying to promote their own IP without paying Facebook for ads. It's rough out here. No one sees my yeah, stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Honestly, community, community, community. Like see, community. again, when I was talking about bartering, it's just networking, is everyone should have like a we should have like a barter Wednesday on like every month or something in the group <laughs> where we all post what we're good at and what we need help with. <laughs> we could just barter. Uh, there's so many things like that that happen like locally that are like a little pop ups that you could see how it becomes oh, successful because really? no matter what you're like, like I'm telling you, the clients that I work with, these are billion dollar, I mean million dollar companies and stuff like that. They're always struggling with the same thing on Instagram. Everyone's playing on it. Like there's not a is. There's no need to, for everyone to be on the same space. So you have to kind of create your own space. And that looks smaller. That looks more like guerrilla warfare. That's getting clever with it. That's like, for for instance, like you just did the um, trade show at Astra. And you had like really great takeaways. That is the style I would do it too. Great little takeaway. Goody bag. Like for me. Going Hold on. You're, you just got really far away and really quiet. Can you come Oops, closer? Hello. Hello. Come louder and closer. Create like. <laughs> <laughs> perfect can you hear me yeah, yeah all right perfect so basically like create experiences create things that are takeaways create things that will help hopefully that someone gets it they want to take a photo of it that they want to share it on their social media take do whatever it means possible just really think outside the box because if you only are thinking about social media in the next post like that's where i was and the lack of feedback, whether it's a like or a share, like that gets to you. You think it's not good enough. You think it's like, you, yeah. Things that, like, that's I'm going to share what you you're do. talking about, my showcase, yeah. as an example, and ignore my messy um, <laughs> desktop. <laughs> but yeah, you know, this is a good point. And thank you for saying that because part of me, I, we were talking beforehand and I was like, I don't know, like, is, is an event like this valuable? Like, is this something I should be spending my time and money on? Because it's not like, it's not a profit driver, but 
if we looked at Instagram and Facebook like that, we would never. We never look at Instagram. We will spend all day on it and we'll be like, it's fine. <laughs> it, it's fine. It, it's getting likes. But you're right. Something like this that brings people together in a small, intimate way, but also creates a uh, like a photo booth opportunity or a, a, an Instagram, honestly, opportunity for people <laughs> yeah. to take photos and feel fun and cool in. That is how you create that sense of community and that interest in your brand. Yeah. And one of the things too is like what's cool is like my mission, like I said, is to create that uh, the, the imagination, let people spark. It's already happening too. I get DMs of people creating their own characters. They, really? Like, Guy and like this dude and their sketches and they're like it's just I'm like yes I'm doing it like something's working whatever I'm doing and it's making sure that I appreciate those moments I'm saying this out loud so I can like yeah. register myself appreciate those moments it's, it's actually happening it's not like I have to wait for the toy to be out there already it's not out there no one's touched it but they're it's already invoking that energy that I put yeah. out there and I can't wait for the TV show this looks like something I would have watched with my dad yes. this feels like Christmas comments are like just like that oh and like gosh. yes I'm doing great. you're doing great you're really doing great as soon as your toys um you. are out actually as soon as you have that production approved maybe we should get you out a press release go back to module seven and get that press release um out i'm sure the toy book would be all over the floor about it um my yeah. last question for you is what toy or game blew your mind as a kid out of all the questions, this was like the hardest one for me. Everyone says <laughs> because that. I still because our generation is so lucky. Like I could think about a million, like oh. Chris, like creepy, creepy crawlers, Tamagotchis, and Nintendo itself. Like there's so many cool things that we played with. Yeah. And like I mean, I, I already said the Ninja Turtles was a big impact in my life. So I'll lean towards things like maybe they were forgotten, like creepy crawlers. I just remember good memories with that of like being in the room making little creations and waiting for the light bulb to die it up and somehow burning yourself on it like those are the silly things like that's to me is again kind of what's missing in today like there were such creative toys back then that was just like let's see what more happens let's there was no data they're not waiting for instagram trends and all this other stuff like who would have said this would have been a hit people just took chances and it got made and if it had the good intentions it was a cool toy then obviously it stuck yeah. Go back uh, to that. Creepy crawlers. <laughs> I love it. Creepy crawlers. Oh, you made me feel so basic with my Polly Pocket answer. But yeah, creepy crawlers. No, but uh, Mighty <laughs> Max for the boys too. That was such a cool one too. Mighty like, Max. Honestly, yes. Oh I had God. like I, I literally had to go to my room, which is like full of all the toys. I was like, which one was the most memorable? <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I'm glad I gave you some time to think about it. Well, Brandon, thank yeah, you yeah. so much. Is there anything else you want to share before I let you go? Even if it's just how to by nine to five warriors or if it's any other tips you want to share um since this was about pitching ip story 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 even if your toy doesn't necessarily have a, t a story and it's an experience pitch the story of how you came up with it and pitch the the story of how you would feel or experience said toy like again watching my pitch it's a story it's not like target demographic next slide you know yeah you know, Traction slide. This is how you'd like, this is where I'm at. Like everything was just a progression and a natural flow. And because I, trust me, I, I've looked a million times. That's how I discovered you uh -huh. of Googling how to pitch a toy and I found your site and all that stuff. Like there's, a, you're going to find a million different answers. Just like anything is just like, what's the right, right. Just tell a good story. And no matter what, you'll be fine. I support that. If you're in my email list, you know, all I do is tell stories all day. <laughs> like, I'm like, so today I went to Mexico. And then, and then at the end, it's like, that's how you develop a toy idea. Like, when did she combine a toy idea with Mexico? How did she do that? Yeah, that's me. That's how I tell a story. I no, that. this was great. And actually, I'm sorry, I have to ask you one more piece of advice. Do you have any sure. resource for somebody that is struggling to, or they, maybe they don't even know they're struggling some like a resource that tells people what is a good story. Do you have you? I mean, I know you learn this because you're in video <sighs> editing, but no, there must be a no. book or a site that you like reference when you're like, is this story told right? I think th this is what I'm gonna hammer it in on, especially in the story world. There's ways to write a, a script. There's ways to write a story. Three act structure. This don't introduce too many characters at once. What's three act so structure? What? Okay. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. Just ignore all of that because at the end of the day, like everyone's got an opinion and it, 
the, what makes a good story is that it doesn't light you up. Uh-huh. Every time you tell it, light you, does it light you up? And then yeah. your light is going to the next person. They're going to get lit up. They're going to remember whatever bit of it that lit them up. They're going to retell it, hopefully, you know. So, yeah, there's a million resources. There's a book literally called Story. It tells you how to t- dive into character development, all these things. I read it. I took some takeaways. But the things that matter the most is, is it a good story? You'll light up and then you'll feel passionate about making it. Passion's everything, just like a toy. Like you want yeah. a toy because you think it's going to be a hit and you yeah. have no emotion just because it lights up and it uses a thing. Like it's going to fail because there's no core connection to it from you. Yeah. So how's the next person, you know? Uh, thank you so much, Brandon. Uh, toy people, thank this you. was an incredible <laughs> conversation. Brandon Braswell, <laughs> the creator, founder, uh, what video editor, <laughs> toy designer. <laughs> I mean, toy or toy lead, lead toy designer, right? Because you had help, right? You had your sculptors working with you. Um, but yeah, for nine oh, to man. five warriors. Go ahead. I just learned how to sculpt. I'm so proud of myself. Oh, excuse me. Now toy designer, is, Brandon Braswell. Now that's one more thing. Go on YouTube and learn, man. I, I honestly stopped myself so much because I thought it was hard. I got an iPad. 3D sculpt? I downloaded yeah, Nomad Sculpt for 15 bucks. Nomad Sculpt? Yes. I'm going to hammer down this. Do this I'm right down, now, I'm going to download it right now. Use your AI generation. Put your ideas out. Get a reference point and then just play on an iPad. And I guarantee you, there's like a YouTube thing that I watched. So it was like three hours long, granted. But after three hours, I became a master. I felt. What? Okay, you so, got to share that I'm link. Excited. And I'll put it in the show notes for this episode. <laughs> yeah. Um. Everybody who's watching on YouTube, you got it first. You know, everybody else <laughs> to the podcast is going to have to wait. So subscribe to the channel. And basically the the summarize, I mean, we don't even have to summarize the episode because Brandon did it so beautifully, but story, that is the summary yes. of the episode. So your your job today, if you're listening to this podcast, is to download Nomad Sculpt. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, it's, it's to, <laughs> is to work on the story behind your toy brand or your IP brand that you're working on and maybe say it again to yourself and say, am I really lit up about this? Does this really excite me? And if it doesn't, you know, don't feel free, feel free to change it. Don't be afraid to change things. Thank you, Brandon. It was a pleasure interviewing you. Thank you for having me. This is exciting. I'm going to go over the the Hasbro and write other emails. Get it done. Okay. (laughs) Take care. (laughs) Thank you. Have a good one. Well, there you have it, Toy People, my interview with Brandon Braswell. Now, if you're just listening to this episode and you wish there was some visual to go along with it, well, you are in luck. There is, my friend. Head over to youtube.com slash the toy coach and search in our podcast playlist. There is an entire playlist for this podcast where you can find the full video of the episode you just listened to. So make sure to check that out. Also, if you want to grab any of the links mentioned in this episode, head over to the toycoach.com forward slash one. Eight, three. And of course, I want you to support nine to five warriors. You can go to nine to five warriors.com or go to the big bad toy store and search for nine to five warriors. Purchase this product. Let's support our fellow toy people who are taking chances and developing products that they know people want and they know people will love. We've got to support each other out here. Before I wrap up, I've got to ask you, if you're listening to this podcast, you love this podcast, you haven't let and you haven't yet left a review, what are you waiting for? Your reviews keep me motivated to keep coming back week after week, but more importantly, they help this podcast reach other people like you. So please, wherever you're listening to this podcast, go over and leave that review. As always, thank you so much for spending this time with me today. I know your time is valuable and that there are a ton of podcasts out there, so it truly means the world to me that you tune into this one. Until next week, I'll see you later, toy people. Thanks for listening to Making It in the Toy Industry podcast with Ajel Wade. Head over to thetoycoach.com for more information, tips, and advice. Hey, are you an aspiring toy inventor or toy entrepreneur? Then you should check out Toy Creators Academy, the first of its kind online program designed to help you develop and pitch your toy ideas. Head over to toycreatorsacademy.com to learn more.